Thank you for joining us today. We would like to welcome you to the Getting Personalized Learning Right webinar series. The Essential Personalized Learning team at the Center for Collaborative Education believes personalized learning is the key to academic success and educational equity. As an NGLC regional partner, we are working with schools and districts to envision models of personalized learning based on the context of their schools. Throughout this series, CCE will focus on these principles of personalized learning. We hope that this framework will stir your thinking towards sustainable, equitable, school-wide change. Our framework for personalized learning is based on five principles, competency-based, flexible, student-driven, authentic learning, and the focus of today's session, dispositions for learning. During this session, I will ask you to take a survey to rate the indicators of dispositions for learning at your school. And then we will review each of the six indicators. We will have questions and answers at the end of the session. As questions arise, please add them to the question box. I will also be referring to tools and resources found in the hand handouts box. I hope that today's session helps you gain valuable insight into your school or district, and then it gives you information to support you in designing personalized learning programming that ensures equi equity and excellence. My name is Ramona Trevino. I'm the Senior Director for District and School Design at CCE. Prior to my work at CCE, I served as a special education teacher, a behavior specialist, a school principal, a founding university charter CEO, university professor, and as a chief academic officer. I have worked in diverse areas in both traditional public schools, charter schools, and independent schools. My guest today is Carla Vigil. Carla is a senior associate with CCE's district and design team and founder and project man manager of the Edu Leaders of Color, Rhode Island. Prior to her work at CCE, Carla was an education strategy specialist with Highlander Institute and a teacher at Blackstone Valley Prep Academy, both in Rhode Island. The Dispositions for Learning principle focuses on equity, identity, and concern for others, so that students develop the attitudes and habits necessary for academic growth and preparation for life. Most of us have been asked the question, what knowledge and skills and dispositions do we want students to possess by the time they graduate from high school in the 21st century? Students, will come of, students who come of age in the 21st century need to be taught different skills that reflect the specific demands of our complex, competitive, information and technology-driven economy and society. These 21st century skills have been taken out of a complex framework and categorized as the four C's. Critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. In his remarks on education to CBS News, President Barack Obama said it best. I'm calling on nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessments that don't simply measure whether students can fill in a bubble on a test, but whether they possess 21st century skills like problem solving, critical thinking, entrepreneurship, and creativity. If schools plan to be intentional in addressing the dispositions for learning principle, and supporting students in developing these four C's, then topics such as cultural competency, social emotional learning, school climate and culture, and mindset must be analyzed and addressed. CCE has developed a school planning document to help students gauge readiness for personalized learning. 
we have looked at school conditions as well as the five principles of personalized learning. For each condition and principle, we have outlined indicators of success. This is a tool for you to use as a rubric to rank practice in order to analyze and address change towards personalized learning. This planning tool can be found in the handouts box labeled Handout 1. Today, we will look specifically at dispositions for learning found in this handout as principal one. A disposition is a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. There has been debate over what this means in relation to learning. Some educators feel it is only important to strengthen basic skills, while others say critical thinking. Some want to promote citizenship or character, while others warn us against the dangers of drug and violence. All, however, recognize that schools play a role, an essential role, in preparing our children to become knowledgeable, responsible, and caring adults. CCE has laid out six indicators of success that are integral to the principle of dispositions for learning. When we look at dispositions for learning indicators of success, they include staff capacity, programming, environment, use of data, growth mindset, and student leadership. Before we begin to discuss each of these, I would like to take a few minutes to see how you would rank your own school or district in these indicators and see what emerges as strengths and challenges for the group. Please use the Dispositions for Learning School Indicator Survey to rank yourself on each indicator. We have just shared a link to this survey found in the question box. I will pause to give you about five minutes to respond.
We have about half of the responses, so we're just going to give a few more minutes. Thank you for taking the time to self-reflect and respond to this survey. What we see from the survey is that indicator three, which addresses environment and especially providing a safe environment with clear expectations for behavior and interactions, and a close tie is the use of data on a regular basis. Our, people are feeling that these are being implemented at a high level. While the staff preparedness, staff capacity, where school staff are being prepared to teach social emotional skills and cultural competency and fostering the language around that is being ranked as emerging or at the beginning stages. I really commend those of you that are working to create safe environments for kids as well as the use of data. We will use our time today to review each of the indicators of success for this principle of dispositions for learning. We will also discuss the importance of culturally responsive personalization. Again, we will address questions at the end of the session. The first indicator addresses staff capacity. It looks at the preparation of staff to teach social and emotional skills and cultural competency while fostering social emotional learning and cultural competence language and behaviors. 
Previously left to specialists, such as school counselors, there is a growing research over the last 10 years that shows that training staff to teach SEL and cultural competence is the missing piece in improving schools in the United States. Some colleges of education are even adding this to their teacher preparation program. We know that knowledge, attitudes, and skills are necessary to manage emotions, set goals, establish relationships, and make responsible decisions. In 2011, a 2011 meta-analysis of SEL interventions in schools, they found that participants significantly improved social-emotional skills, attitudes, and, and behaviors, as well as made an 11% gain in achievement. From this study, recommended practices for developing social-emotional skills included teaching explicit SEL lessons, instructional practices to promote SEL, integration of social-emotional learning within academic curriculum, and the organization of school-wide SEL strategies. The educational shift has been that social-emotional skills should be taught and not just controlled through behavior management strategies. This has implications for the role of teacher and the training of teachers that may be needed in social emotional learning, growth mindset strategies, and cultural competence. This indicator asks you, what professional development have you provided to support teachers in social emotional learning, cultural competence, growth mindset, and habits of mind? A very important element of our first indicator is cultural competence. Addressing educational equity is central to CCE's mission. We are very fortunate to have our guest presenter, Carla Vigil, join us to discuss her work on culturally responsive teaching. Hi, and thank you, Ramona, for the introduction. I'm super excited and honored to be part of this very important topic. Uh, we will spend the next five minutes, oh, well, I will spend the next five minutes speaking about an area we often miss when sharing practices and strategies with educators and leaders. A critical component and what we believe to be the foundation to the disposition of our learning principles is being able to acknowledge and truly empower students' identities. Uh, in order to support their development, the development of their attitudes and the habits necessary to succeed. We believe that culturally responsive teaching, or CRT, is a key practice that enables all educators to connect and build solid relationships where, with their students. The definitions out there of culturally responsive teaching, uh, we've, we've researched and um, explored different definitions and based on theory and research, our definition is that CRT is the ability to use cultural characteristics, experiences, and perspectives of all diverse learners as conduits for teaching them more effectively. This is really essential in order to truly personalize learning. We are now exploring the development of a four uh, core principles framework grounded in theory and research that supports the implementation of CRT practices. So if you look at the diagram, you'll notice that we start with cultural profic proficiency. This is the first place to start in order to develop connections with students. So in order to understand our students, we must understand our own identities. It, it includes acknowledging that our lens are influenced by life experiences, values, assumptions, and our identity. It is during this process where teachers will have the opportunity to self-reflect and gain a deeper understanding of how their own identity impacts their attitudes and teaching practices. We also want to include that during this phase, teachers will begin to unpack biases, and assumptions to create a real authentic 
equity lens. Move um, to the next principle, you'll see that it's developing and maintaining student relationships. Um, we know that many teachers, many teaching approaches such as blended learning can be successful. I've seen it happen in many classrooms that I've done one-on-one -on -one coaching in. However, there seems to be a consistent challenge in many classrooms, and that challenge is connecting with the students. So if we don't have true connection with our students, there will be no engagement. And if we don't have engagement, that that, then that really impacts the academic success of our learners. So we really want to think about how to not only develop, but maintain that trusting, solid relationship with, with our students. The goal in this process is that once a teacher has become fully conscious of their own identity and understands their experiences and, and backgrounds and how it impacts their day-to-day -day practice in the classroom, he or she can begin to embrace and accept all students' cultural characteristics. Additionally, teachers will begin to demonstrate a cultural caring to build a strong community. Essentially, in this goal, um, we want educators to gain and demonstrate a strong understanding of how relationships are the cornerstone of culturally responsive teaching and personalized learning. If we move to the next pillar, um, it's a principle, it's um, knowledge construction. So we want to we want to make sure that teachers explore the science behind culture and how it impacts and frames the brain. Many will ask, what does culture have to do with learning? And so here is the, the, fa the phase where we explore that. Teachers should make information meaningful and accessible to all, all students. When you help students think about how they think, it helps build neuroplasticity which helps create more neural pathways. It is important that they activate, or teachers activate students' prior knowledge or schemas so that they're able to create, make connections and create new knowledge. By understanding students' culture and experiences, teachers develop skills to use cultural scaffolding to help students achieve. So when folks say a student don't have the capacity to learn or quote unquote they can't it's simply not true we're just not reaching and connecting with students to impact their attitudes and behaviors to learn more about this process um, i would encourage folks to pick up a book by james bank it's called uh, an introduction to multicultural education or a newer book that just came out by zaretta hammond called Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. Now the last principle is differentiated assessment. And in this area, we explore the connection between learners and knowing their background, backgrounds deeply in order to use effective culturally sensitive assessments so that we could close these learning gaps. So teachers in this process gain an understanding of how to use a variety of instructional and formative assessment strategies to meet the needs of all diverse learners. The goal in, in our framework, or this framework that we're still developing, um, is that through exploration and guidance during these four principles, teachers will leave with a stronger understanding of their own identity and a clear vision on how to engage with students in, in a culturally responsive approach. Uh, by using culturally responsive personalized practices, teachers will be able to develop and modify instruction that meets the needs of our diverse learners. Most importantly, they'll be able to develop a healthy and solid relationship with students to help acquire the skills that they need to succeed in the classroom and the world beyond. I want to highlight one important point, and uh, that point is that too often, culturally responsive teaching is promoted as a way to reduce behavior problems or just motivate students while, while downplaying or ignoring its ability to support rigorous cognitive development. We want to 
use this, this framework to connect with students, to acknowledge identities, but most importantly, to set high expectations for learners and, um, and make content rigorous. I want to end my portion of of this of the webinar by saying that uh, by quoting a a person that I admire dearly, and she states that equality is everybody having a pair of shoes. Equity is providing everyone with a pair of shoes that fit, and that was said by Enid Lee. So thank you, Ramona. Thank you, Carla. You'll find a handout on culture responsive personalization labeled Handout 2 in the handout box. Very important information. Our second indicator addresses social emotional learning programs. It focuses on social emotional learning activities or programs in schools that support students' social and emotional development, promote optimal health, and prevent risk behaviors. There are many examples of how this can happen in a school. Counseling, anti-bullying programs, service learning, character education curriculum, and other typical student support services, such as nursing, social work services, and student support teams. Social emotional learning programming should always be age appropriate and can range from curriculums, such as second step or open circle, to advisory programs at middle school and high school. In selecting effective SEL programs, we are reminded to incorporate four elements represented by the acronym SAFE. Programs should be S sequenced. They should provide A active learning. F focused on SEL goals. And instruction should always be E explicit. CCE has created a SEL curriculum program guide for your reference. You can find this labeled handout number three in the handout box. This will help you get started with looking at research-based programs. Advisory is a core structure for personalizing schooling for adolescents. The challenge is crafting the best program for your students and faculty tailored to a student's needs. As an example, the advisory guide presents various advisory models, and it helps planning teams think through nine major areas that they should address. These include goals and outcomes, grouping, content, themes, format, schedule, advisor's role, professional development, accountability, linking advisory to other programs, and materials and resources. Setting up an advisory program should also include planning for student orientation, community building, providing tools for teaching and learning, goal setting, life skills, and career exploration. So Indicator 2 asks us, what school-wide student support programs, research-based SEL programs, or advisory guides have you, has your school investigated or implemented to support social and emotional development and health? Our third indicator addresses a safe environment for learning with clear expectations for behavior and interaction. As you remember, Participants rated this the highest. School and community leaders, as well as parents, agree that creating safe, supportive environments in schools is a high priority. This is a key component when integrating SEL systematically into all aspects of school and district practice. It has become particularly important to educators at this period in history when young people are experiencing unusual degrees of stress throughout our society. Effective SEL implementation should include a strong commitment to promoting a positive school climate. Organizations such as the National Center on Safe, Supportive Learning Environments, 
and the National School Climate Center have provided resources, tools, and research on this indicator. To address safety and ensure a positive school climate, districts throughout the country are developing multi-tiered systems of support or positive behavioral interventions and support strategies known as PBIS. The purpose of PBIS is to improve the effectiveness, efficiency, and equity of schools. PBIS helps schools to develop school-wide systems and structures to improve social, emotional, and academic outcomes for all students using consistency, targeted behavior expectations, and positive language. With this indicator, I ask you, what measures are you using to ensure a safe environment and clear expectations for learning? Building off of previous indicators, we now look at how the school collects and analyzes and uses data about student behavior, academic achievement, cultural competence, school climate, and social and emotional comp competence on a regular basis. Schools have become proficient in collecting and analyzing achievement data, attendance data, dropout rates, and behavioral data. Equal effort should be given to collecting, analyzing, and planning for measures related to equity and SEL. That includes measuring student identity and concern for others. CCE believes that the effective use of data through ongoing data inquiry cycles is a key driver for school and district transformation, and in particular for improving instruction and assessment. CCE's model for data-based inquiry, or DBI, includes a deliberative, a deliberative process that examines and analyzes a range of data, identifies challenges, and develops action plans. Schools must go beyond standardized test scores. You can find in your hand, handout box, handout number four, which describes CCE's database inquiry cycle process. So with this indicator, we ask, what data about student behavior, academic achievement, cultural competence, school climate, and social emotional competence are you using? In Indicator 5, we have specifically addressed the importance of current research on growth mindset and recommend that schools are intentional in supporting students to develop a growth mindset so that students begin to believe in their own self-efficacy and personal success. Based on the groundbreaking research of Carol Dweck, we know that a fixed mindset can result in students who avoid challenges, ignore useful feedback, and give up easily. It can lead to depression, lower self-esteem, and decreased motivation and engagement. On the other hand, growth mindset helps students see that failure is not a stopping point, but a place to grow. Growth mindset increases self-confidence, persistence, achievement, and supports a view that extended effort is the path to mastery. With a growth mindset, students learn from criticism and mistakes, embrace challenges, take risks, and find inspiration in the success of others. Dweck invites us to train teachers in building a growth mindset by encouraging effort, acknowledging persistence and hard work, and praising the process students use in their learning, as opposed to telling students that they are smart or talented and labeling students or focusing just on grades. With this indicator, we question if your school has addressed the importance of current research on growth mindset. Has your school intentionally focused on supporting students to develop a growth mindset. In our last indicator, we look at the importance of student leadership. 
Personalized learning classrooms strive to create self-directed learners. Classroom, school, and community leadership opportunities are important to achieve this. Students are more autonomous when they learn the art of motivating, influencing, and directing others towards a common goal. Learning how to build relationships with teams, defining roles, and achieving tasks builds confidence and a strong sense of self-identity and social awareness. It also builds strong communication, interpersonal skills, and skill in responsible decision making. I end by asking, what class, school, or community leadership opportunities does your school provide for students? We have shared what we consider to be the indicators that would, if strategically planned for, ensure equity and the development of student attitudes and habits necessary for academic growth and preparation for life. What questions do you have? I will now answer questions that you may have posted in the question box. Our first question asks about relationships. What is the first step school leaders can take to build student relationships for the second section of culturally responsive, re, culturally responsive framework. I will defer to Carla, as she had explained that framework, to answer this question. Carla, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here. So what is the first step school leaders can take to build those student relationships based on your framework? So, so as a leader, that's it, the most um, important place to start because you're setting the example for your staff. I would say it would definitely start with with understanding yourself. So it starts with identity development. So I would go back to making sure that not only um, as a leader you're culturally proficient, but you have some sort of training or system in place within your staff culture that promotes cultural competence and prof proficiency. I think that when you have that set up, it automatically it automatically helps teachers build relationships with their students. So I would definitely concentrate on identity development. And many times we kind of overlook that, but it starts with self. So for both teachers and both leaders. Thank you, Carla. I hope that that helped. I mean, we, we all know that simple things like student inventories, asking students to um, do projects and products that um, they could possibly uh, bring from their backgrounds from home, um, how, teachers really start to engage students in those informal conversations um, can go, can really make a difference in building those student relationships. I, I love the, the idea that students um, want to know that you care before they care what you know. <laughs> so that those caring type of questions to delve deeper in, who is this learner? And what is their best modality? What are their interests? What are their passions? I've worked in uh, some schools where instead of calling it personalized learning, we call it passion learning. And it's based on the fact that students had voice and choice in certain times of the day in things that they were passionate about. I have another question. What are some ways that schools can build cultural capacity beyond going to professional development class or to a series? Carla, do you have any thoughts on building cultural capacity? Sure. Um, so 
the interesting thing about culture is that culture is ever changing. It's constantly, it really, culture depends on, on your environment and uh, your experiences. So, you know, your culture can change. So in order to be cultural, to have cultural proficiency, uh, we, it's, it's not, you're never going to be culturally competent. You constantly have to be learning. You constantly have to be open to new ideas. So I think in order to build cultural capacity, it's, it's, you know, not just a set of series and not just one touch point with a professional development. It has to be rooted in, in yourself. So you have to be open-minded. So the same thing we tell a lot of students in the classroom to have a growth mindset, we must have that growth mindset, not only within our classroom and our school culture, but also outside in the real world. So I would encourage you to learn about new things, to learn about different cultures, to, uh, to read different books, uh, to attend different events, maybe events that you wouldn't uh, normally attend. So in, in, in the end, I think that you're constantly trying to develop the, your lens. And the only way you'll develop that lens is by being open to different things out of your comfort zone. I also want to comment on this as a longtime principal. I feel leaders of schools and their leadership teams build that school culture, I think, by modeling what it means to be part of a school with talking points constantly targeting what the goals of that school to build the culture of that school. I think within the context of the student body, what is it that is that you value? What are the rituals? What are the ceremonies? What are the opportunities for parent and community engagement? When you look at this question and you ask ways that schools can build cultural capacity, I look at the word school to go beyond teachers. I look at it as the school culture as a whole. Where is that school? What is the context of the community around the school? What's the history of the school? We often have new leaders that come in and with new ideas, but I feel strongly it's important to embrace the history of the place. What is the spirit of that school? And so by modeling culture within the school and setting up some expectations around the elements of culture that are important in every classroom, I think that you can start to build that cultural capacity. Of course, professional development, as Carla mentioned, I just want to say, identifying an anchor text, there is so much out there that can support you in this area. Carla has named a few resources, and there are a few resources that we'll share with you in our handouts. But what is that anchor text that you want to build your cultural capacity from? What is that framework? Carla has given us one. As we said, we're still developing and we're we're preparing to provide professional development in this area. But I think it begins with the leadership and, and the context of the school that you're working in. I'm going to go to another question about advisory and capacity. And the question asks, how do schools implement meaningful advisory programs when teachers are feeling like they do not have the capacity to address social emotional learning and cultural proficiency skills. I think this is an extremely important question. And I guess in looking at it, I want to say that each of these five indicators dovetail and support each other. You cannot build that cultural capacity without building teacher's capacity. We know that currently there are some colleges of education that are starting to talk about social emotional learning and cultural proficiency, but it's not enough. Districts really need to decide what are what is the criteria that they want their teachers to be prepared in teaching this. One resource that I use is CASEL, the Center for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. 
You can find them at castle.org, that's C-A-S-E-L.org. There's a vast um, array of resources and materials on their website that can help you start to support um, your journey in creating social-emotional learning programming. I always go back to the idea that teachers feel supported or they can do their job best when they have a curriculum. This is what they have been trained to do. So having some curriculum frameworks or actual curriculum programs or at least a scope and sequence to help guide teachers in what they need to know and be able to do in order to teach in these areas I think is very important. We, we mentioned the advisory guide as a resource. That's just one example. That type of resource can go a long way in developing an advisory program where teachers feel confident in their instruction. I also want to mention um, the importance of planning time. If you do not currently have an advisory program and you want to create a meaningful one, this needs to be included in your strategic plan. And time needs to be given for teachers or a subcommittee or release time possibly for teachers to start to map out what that advisory program might look like. Of course, within the context of your school. There are a number of social emotional learning resources. I mentioned CASEL and a number of social emotional lear learning curriculums that I mentioned are in uh, handout number two. We have time for another question. Carla, is there anything that you would add um, before I go to the next question around supporting teachers? in their capacity around cultural proficiency skills? Um, the only thing I would add is that I think it's important from from um, the leadership is to make sure that there are systems in place that support teachers to be open and, and also systems that and policies that empower teachers' um, identities. So that's that's the only thing I would add. So I really like the next question. I spent a lot of time at elementary school uh, as a leader. The question is, when incorporating student leadership at the elementary level, what are some of the challenges teachers need to be prepared to face? And what are ways to counter these? So I guess the first, my first thought on this question is, again, the comment that all instruction should be developmentally appropriate. I think in creating a leadership program at the elementary level, again, a scope and sequence, what do you want teach what do you want students to know and be able to do at each grade level in teaching leadership skills? So a kindergarten that would look very different than in fourth or fifth grade. And I think breaking that down to developmental levels is a first step to avoid challenges. Also, if it's teacher generated, where they are engaged in the process of creating a leadership program, it will also go a long way in being implemented. I do believe that experiences um, that students have in leadership starts with the smallest things that happen within the classroom. So that teacher, understanding her role, that leadership is a priority, again, back to your talking points as a leader of a school, leadership is important across the school. And at every turn, using the theory behind growth mindset, really going out of your way to build that capacity with a positive positive approach and reinforcing students at every turn. Structured activities such as community service activities or as many schools do, um, food drives are, are simplistic 
but they should always have some core instructional goals behind them. I've always felt a little sad when a food drive turns into counting the counting the number of cans and who brought in the most versus how did it feel to be a contributor in your in your community and what is your role what is your leadership role as a student in supporting your community and those of in need. So making sure that the goals of every activity are clearly related to a set of leadership goals school-wide that are developmentally appropriate. And I think that, in my mind, is one of the best ways to address that question. That's the last question we have, unless anyone else has a question. We'll give it a minute. Well, we hope you can join us again on Wednesday, February 28th, from 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern Time, when we, be, when we discuss the principle of student-driven learning. I want to thank you for joining us today. The fact that you took the time to be with us speaks volumes for your commitment to your professional growth and your commitment to public education. We believe that by addressing the principle of dispositions for learning in our schools, the foundation will be built for equity, student success, and readiness for the global workforce. We recommend that you take the tools presented in this session Go back to your school leadership teams and begin the discussion and planning for personalized learning. You will find resources that I re reference for each indicator listed on handout five. Thank you again.